Welcome, everyone, to our 2022 Interface Lecture Series in Science and Theology. I'm delighted to see you tonight, uh, those who are both here in person and those who are joining us via the live stream. It's good to be together in body again. Um, we're still getting used to public events, but we're grateful that you're here with us tonight. We'll soon be hearing from our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Niels Heinrich Gregerson, who's traveled from Denmark to be with us. So a warm welcome to you, Dr. Gregerson. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. Before he speaks, though, I'll briefly introduce Regent College uh, and our work in theology and science in particular. So for those of you who are new to our community, Regent is an international graduate school of Christian studies and an affiliate of the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver, BC. Along with our neighbors at UBC, I acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. My name is David Robinson, and I'm a project co-leader uh, along with Professor Ross Hastings, who's here tonight for Regent Interface. I'm also the incoming R. Paul Stevens uh, Assistant Professor in Marketplace Theology and Leadership, uh, which I'm delighted to take part in because Marketplace Theology is an, an exceptional opportunity for us, and it's one where the sciences play a key role. Um, sciences intersect in all kinds of ways with business and labor and uh, people who are living out uh, their lives in the world as Christians. Our goal with Interface is to equip people uh, to engage with the sciences with both humility and courage. Something unique about our programs at Regent here is that Christian biologists and chemical engineers sit in classes together alongside uh, business people and, yes, pastors. So in pursuing our goal of training the whole people of God, we're grateful to have the support of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, particularly its program, Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. Our grant with the AAAS has run over the past two years, and it culminates this week with our final lecture series. Before Dr. Gregerson speaks, let me give a few quick instructions on how the evening will proceed. Dr. Gregerson will speak for approximately 55 minutes, after which we'll have approximately 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. So you can be preparing your questions as he's speaking, uh, whether you're online or joining us here in person. And I'll give directions for that uh, after the lecture. Afterwards as well, there'll be a chance to meet Dr. Uh, Gregerson and see his books at the fabulous Regent Bookstore. Now I'll turn it over to Professor Paul Allen, uh, Welcome, Paul, who is the Academic Dean of Corpus Christi College, our neighboring theological school, and Professor Allen is also an advisor on the Region Interface Project. So he'll introduce our speaker tonight. Welcome. Thanks very much, David. It's a pleasure and honor to uh, to introduce Niels Henrik Gregerson to you uh, this evening. Uh, I met Niels actually quite a number of years ago. Um, uh, we've, been, we've sort of interacted uh, and crossed paths at a, at a few conferences, but probably the, the memory that, uh, that sticks in my brain most of all is um, uh, a discussion that took place between myself, uh, Niels, and another Lutheran theologian in a piazza at Castel Gandolfo, just outside Rome. Uh, and the conversation turned to Thomas Aquinas, so I thought naturally as a Catholic, I was on very much on home ground, and this, wouldn't this be uh, fun to discourse with two Lutheran theologians on Thomas Aquinas? Well, little did I know that uh, Professor Gregerson knew uh, Thomas Aquinas very well, very, very well, and so I was soon <laughs> put in my place uh, by uh, someone who was evidently uh, extremely learned uh, about something that I thought I, should, I evidently should have known better. Professor Gregerson is a professor of systematic theology at the University of Copenhagen. He is the author of several books and has edited a dozen volumes in theology and the field of science and religion. Uh, among those uh, volumes, I would mention Incarnation on the Scope and Depth of Christology, Cambridge Press 2015, and then a co-edited work with Paul Davies, the physicist, titled Information and the Nature of Reality from Physics to Metaphysics, and that's uh, 2014. 
Dr. Gregerson's research interests include science and religion, with a focus on the significance of evolutionary theory and complexity studies. Contemporary theology, especially the topics of creation and incarnation, philosophical and social anthropology, especially concerning risk-taking and generosity. He was a leader of the Danish Science and Theology Forum, vice president of the European Society for the Study of Science and Theology, ESOT, and a founding executive committee member and trustee for the International Society of Science and Theology, Science and Religion, pardon me. He also represented the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Denmark in the Lutheran World Federation and was chairperson of the board for the Institute for Ecumenical Research in Strasbourg. Professor Gregerson has been a fellow of Center for Theological Inquiry at Princeton University, the JR fellow at the CTNS, the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences Berkeley, as well as uh, a Boyle lecturer. He lectures widely in Europe and the US and has been a keynote speaker also in South Africa, Australia, and Asia, including China, Japan, and South Korea. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gregerson to Vancouver and to Regent College. Thank you so much for this very generous welcome from uh, David Richardson and, and, and from uh, my good old friend, uh, Professor Allen. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, so long time, so many things have been closed down, uh, but now we are here and I have already enjoyed much of the community spirit here during the, the day and a little uh, um, yesterday evening too. So. I will be talking about Christ in a world of creativity and suffering, both creativity and, and suffering. And um, uh, the picture I've chosen comes from the San Clemente Church in Rome, uh, placed only four or 500 meters from Antonianum, the Franciscan uh, uh, university uh, faculty uh, in, in, in Rome, and has this beautiful apsis uh, it comes from 1320 to, th to, to, to 30, where you see, in a sense, uh, the cross of Christ as uh, on this uh, blue background with, with birds, of course also uh, uh, doves, uh, uh, icons of the Holy Spirit, and you just see a hand up there, and then you have this sense of, of a green environment in which uh, the cross of Christ is placed. And in a sense, I see this as, as encapsulating uh, uh, one of the central visions of the concept of deep incarnation that I'm going to introduce uh, today. So where will we be going this evening? Well, in a sense, I will be introducing the view of deep incarnation to you, and I will do it in a little more detail today than I will do in, uh, in tomorrow's lecture, not to speak of, 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 of the, uh, the third lecture. So uh, I will focus on this because this, in a sense, sets the theological agenda for what I'm going to say. And I want also here to show how it builds upon, but also adds something uh, to the theology of creation that is usually uh, actually uh, uh, the the seen as the natural discussion, discussion partner for, uh, for evolutionary theory, and so it is in a sense. And then I will go on arguing more on the biological side about biological agency and biological pain, how they actually belong together, and uh, point to the renewed emphasis on biological agency in current evolutionary thinking. And then I hope that we can have a discussion on how, how uh, deep Christology, but also deep pneumatology actually can inform the way in which we are seeing our world, also the world that we know through, uh, through uh, theory, uh, through evolutionary theory, through Darwinism. Yeah. I consider myself a Christian Darwinist, as many others do, but, I'm, but Darwinism is evolving 
in a sense, theological understanding is also evolving, uh, but uh, the biological world is there. It has not changed that much, even if we live now in an Anthropocene era, much of the same, all of the same biochemistry is there and so on. So let's begin with, with Croatian theology. Because um, why is it so natural to begin with Croatian theology? Well, simply because uh, uh, God as creator is the source of all that is. But then what does that mean to say source and not having once created it? It means that it is a divine agency that actually allows integrity and freedom of the world of creation to emerge. There will be, there are possible doctrines of creation that actually not allows for that. But I will not discuss them here because I think I want to, to stay on the uh, on um, mainstream ground. Uh, Rowan Williams, uh, the former archbishop, is one who is, uh, has expressed this view, saying that the understanding of divine life in, cla in classic creation theologies allow created existence its own integrity and dignity and deliver us from a theology in which God is in danger of being seen simply as a very important or uniquely powerful agent in the universe competing with other agencies for space or control. So this is what we do if we, in a sense, reify God and make God an item among other items with who is then going to be in competition, who is really uh, 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 deciding if God. Uh, 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 but but the, the position that I will take in is very classic and will give three very different witnesses of that in what now comes. And this is if that as if, you, if we, we really take seriously the concept of infinity, of divine infinity, then you, cannot, then you cannot designate a room that is purely secular, but neither can you designate a room that is where, in, in the world of creation, where it is God and not, and not creature. So we find this actually in Thomas Aquinas, where he, he is saying that God is the underlying primary cause that works in and through secondary causes. Hence, God exists in the things, he says, in Suva Tiru Die. Then I take quite another witness, the book of the 24 philosophers, um, which is, we don't know whether, uh, whether it's written in the, in the fourth century or in, in the 14th century, but it's, it's, it's rather very many very thoughtful things are, are said there. God is like a circle whose center is everywhere and whose periphery cannot be circumscribed because God as infinite by definition cannot be defined, cannot be delimited. And then my own uh, um, uh, favorite, uh, since I'm myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Lutheran theologian, Martin Luther's uh, Eucharistic theology, there will be differences between him and, and Thomas Aquinas, of course, but I think in very many things not. So he would also say that God is bigger than the biggest and smaller than the, uh, the, the, uh, and than the smallest, a little a bit like the book of the 24 philosophers, he would say that God is at work in, with, and under the masks of creation. Also, Luther speaks about a cooperation between uh, God and the world, even also with sinful people. And then he makes an addition, which is, a, which is important for the, the view of deep incarnation, uh, which is to say, never take humanity away from God's divinity. So you cannot divorce the spiritual and the material and, uh, or the human. And that is, in a sense, um, 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 a basic intuition of deep intuition, of, of, of deep incarnation. So the same logic of divine infinity applies to Christology too, because it has to do with the divine, but in which sense is also the human figure of, of, of Jesus, part of who God is or who Christ is from eternity to eternity. I again take, my, take uh, Rowan Williams as my, as my witness, so to speak, 
uh, because he is saying, and I think it's basically quite correct, uh, that the doctrine of Christ's person as developed through the patristic and medieval periods represented a, a steady trajectory of pulling away from mythological accounts of incarnation as if it were an episode in the life of a heavenly subject. So one thing is that we reify God as a, and, and, and puts God in contrast to the world. If God is the generous giver, then, then there, there is no such contrast. If God is the one who gives autonomy, there cannot be a principal con uh, contrast at, at least. And then we can then say, well, incarnation, this happened the 30 years. And this was an episode in, in, in God's life. But that doesn't make sense either. If it is the case that, the, that Jesus was the revealer of God, and so that you, you, we have to say that just as this human person was, so is God from the beginning, now and forever. Otherwise, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, could not be the revealer of God. He could not be God's internal son. So this is the argument that I am then making in a sort of a amendment. I hope it is a friendly amendment uh, to Rowan Williams' view, uh, and I think it is. Uh, that is that there is, is also a, a, a sort of not infinity in the same sense as God is infinite, but a form, a, a sense of a stretch and something that is, uh, that we live in a universe that is, that is uh, widespread. So my argument is, and now it's me who is trying to formulate something, that if God wasn't Jesus, in the midst of this world. Of course you can say, I don't believe in that, and that is okay, but then we cannot talk about Christology in a way. And if Jesus was bodily raised into infinite divine life, Jesus was res rhetoric, resurrected into God, so to speak, into God's infinite life. And you can say, well, I don't believe in, 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 in resurrection, but then, of course, you will not have a Christology either. So, but if these two ifs um, apply, and I think they are very basic, not very difficult assumptions in, 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 in a way, I think, then we cannot think humanity, embodiment, and materiality away from God's nature, that is, from what and who God is. So this is what I'm going to see as the, as the important addition of Christology and also pneumatology to a theology of creation in, in discussion with, with evolutionary the, uh, theory because Christology actually offers a sort of a self-description of who the God is who is supposed to be present in the whole world of creation uh, according to creation theology. So it's about who the God is who is there. So now we come to the backbone theory, theory of deep incarnation, which actually, uh, um, actually rem uh, reminds us about that it is nowhere said in the New Testament that God became a man. It is said that the word of God, the logos of, of God, not the Father, not the Spirit, but the logos of God became sax, became flesh. And flesh is something more than being a human, an anthropos. And being a human is something more than being just a man. So we have perhaps too early, too prematurely, uh, in a sense, we have limited our concept of Christology by not taking uh, John 1.14 in account. So I argue that there are three meanings of sax, and I hope it's not all too controversial, but everything is controversial, of course. Uh, the meaning one is that it is the concrete body and flesh of Jesus from Nazareth, of course. This is what is meant in, in, uh, in uh, John 1.14.
But then it's added, and he lived amongst us which in a sense gives some of the breadth and scope of his, of his uh, uh, life that I'll come back to. Sax in the New Testament also means sinful flesh, All, a meaning also present in, in John, what is born from the flesh is flesh, what is born from the spirit is spirit. But most importantly, Sax also has a much more extensive meaning it is the realm of materiality in its most general extension, without any prior evaluation. Not only sinful flesh, but there is flesh. The sun is flesh. The bird that is singing is flesh. A an example of beautiful love are fleshy. Though perhaps with a special note of something transitory and vulnerable to decay. Flesh is that with, with which both flowers and fades. And this basic meaning of, of, of uh, sacks we also find in the Old Testament. So we have in the Old Testament the, the uh, term kol bashar. All people are, are grass. They do not say people are, there are people and then there are grass, and they l are like one another. They say people are grass, basically. Their constancy is like the flower of the field that is not very constant. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath, ruach, of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word daba of our God will stand forever. So we simply belong to this psychic existence, which we also call the universe, simply, without any pejorative. And we have also much more uh, uh, metaphorical uses of, 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 of sarks, hearts of flesh. Sarks shall replace the old hearts of, of stone. And the point is that there is and must be a minimally a coextensiveness between logos and sarks. So there cannot be any elements of, of sarks in which Christ is totally absent. Christ will be crying where, the, where injustice is taking place. So, so Christ must be in with and under, and not only in with and under, but also for the, the suffering creatures. Only a suffering God can speak to us, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. And he also said that, that Christ is not only present for me or for us, but also for all. Not only pro nobis, uh, but pro alias, for the others as well. Of course, God is more than extensive in space, but I'm just saying that this is the basic concept. We also have it. In the, in, the, in the Greek uh, tradition, where sax means everything material under the sun because they thought it was ethereal uh, 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 above the moon, and, uh, uh, sorry, the moon. And in Stoicism, we find a sort of pantheism, which is not the same as the one that I'm advocating, but saying that there is a coextensiveness of logos and, mat and matter. Why? Because things are extensive and Logos is, in a sense, a pervasive power. And it is this Logos that actually became flesh in Jesus of Nazareth and thereby forever conjoined God to the world of flesh in this intimate way. So uh, this is what, these are one of the ideas of, of deep incarnation, and I, um, uh, and I bring two, uh, three books there. Uh, and uh, the first one uh, is the one that I edited in 2017. These are different than when I made them, uh, which is to say that, um, that, that I, I coined in 2001 uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the term that a deep incarnation goes into the very tissue of biological is, uh, existence and the whole system and nature. And I did not, I just meant that there was a radical stretch from God into reach into the depth of matter. And I, it was very early, but now it's uh, 21 years uh, uh, um, 
uh, ago, and I actually extended it later to the physics of information, to deep history, axial age discussion, classic uh, Christology, and not a least. But I owe thanks to a lot of people. Dennis Edwards, who has written the Veil book about uh, deep incarnation, he, this was the last thing he, 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 he uh, managed to, to write. I was very happy to be part of its emergence and writing a preface. This is my last communication with him since he died. Uh, uh, shortly after, and then Elizabeth uh, Johnson asked the beasts about uh, Darwin and the God of Love, and 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 they have both contributed very much uh, to my own thinking. So I would not be able to to say all what I'm saying today without them. And this also applies to uh, Celia Dean Drummond, uh, the biologist theologian uh, 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 from from England, and. Um, and Christopher Southgate, also a, a, a biologist, a theologian, um, each have had their own uh, reading. Uh, Celia has has emphasized the drama of 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 evolution, which I think is an important point. Christopher Southgate has has elaborated a very very clear uh, attempt at at uh, at making a evolutionary theodicy. And I should also mention uh, Bob Russell who has uh, done very important work for me on physics that I could not do. Ted Peters, who has brought uh, deep incarnation into the discussion about extraterrestrial life. Jürgen Moltmann, who has not done very, he, he has just said, I think, uh, I always thought that way. So this is, in a sense, what he is writing in, in my book there. And that is fine uh, for me. Uh, and then I also have critics, uh, among them Matthew Eaton, who wrote his, dis uh, his uh, dissertation on deep incarnation, who, who thinks that I'm, in a sense, uh, uh, staying too much in the anthropological scheme. So uh, I'm actually uh, critiqued both from the right side that I'm saying that I, I don't take Jesus of Nazareth seriously, and I'm criticized from the, from the left side by the, those who say I'm taking Jesus all too seriously. I should just speak about a pan-incarnationalism. So this is where I am. But I'm, I just, it's interesting if you, if you tr think that you are saying something important and, and maybe also a little new, it sounds new, then you, then you easily uh, discover that you are not so original. So here we have the encyclical of John Paul II from 1986. I was a young man at that time. So he wrote, the incarnation of God's Son means not only the assumption of human nature into unity with God, but in some sense, the assumption of everything that is flesh, the, ass the assumption that, that of the whole humanity, of the whole visible and material world, the incarnation therefore also has a cosmic significance and dimension. So I'm just very glad, and maybe this is why there are more Roman Catholic uh, uh, theologians that have this immediate understanding of what deep incarnation is about, but how is this in some sense to be qualified? That is, in a sense, the, uh, 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 the problem. So let me do a little methodology here first. Um, Wolfgang Pannenberg, in God and Man from 1964, he was also my teacher later on, he makes this famous distinction between a Christology from above versus a Christology from, uh, uh, from below. Uh, one begins from the divinity of Jesus, and then you have incarnation, he says, or you have a Christology from below, rising from the historical man, Jesus, to the recognition of his divinity. And then you actually end up with the concept of incarnation in the very end. I think that I would, that I actually, in my understanding of deep incarnation, do have a high Christology, meaning uh, that Jesus is being sent to, by God to reach human beings meaning that God was present in him in such pervasive sense that he himself was one with God in his teaching actions and reactions, that Jesus himself, and this is perhaps the most important thing, was exemplifying divinity in his human behavior. That is, that he is the character description of who the eternal God is, that is, is, was, and will be in relation to the created world. 
So I do not have any specific theory about the inner relations between the, the, uh, the father and the son uh, above what I can, what can be, uh, be understood from below. But the point is that we here see in function the this thus structure of Christology, which I take to be basic. As this person lived, lived thus is God. Otherwise, it would not be a, 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 a revelation or it would be a, a half-baked revelation like so many others, uh, uh, but still so. But what I'm, then, uh, what I'm then adding is that a Christology uh, uh, is and must be correspondingly low in materiality. That the incarnation involves a divine embrace of the world of interacting human bodies, the entire world of material flesh, down to material constituents, biological organisms, and tissues. Uh, that is what I named, what I called uh, SACS III. But in some way, Christ must also, in order to be a redeemer, also embrace, and what does it mean, embrace human sin and evolutionary suffering? God must be there, be the forgiver, be the healer. So even in relation to, to sax too, sin, there must be a, a, a divine presence there, otherwise uh, we would be left to our own. So I think that if I were now to, with, with hindsight, to, de to, to describe the methodology of deep incarnation, then I would say it does not begin neither from above nor from below, but it begins in the middle. It begins in the concrete person, uh, the concrete person Jesus as written, as, as, um, as um, uh, depicted in the Gospels, and I know that each of them depicts Jesus in different ways, and this is always the case. But I, th I would emphasize two things. First of all, God was in him. This is a very residual Christology, not very high. And also that he was with all others. That you cannot understand Jesus of Nazareth without his networks. Which, and you cannot understand uh, Jesus without God the Father, that he made transparent in his life and teaching, hence revealed. You cannot understand uh, the, the person of Jesus of Nazareth as described in the Gospels uh, uh, without being the one in who lived in human resonance with the Spirit, in a sense, enacted. In many ways, it was the Spirit. It is the Spirit that is the the true protagonist of the Gospels, even on the, even the fourth uh, Gospel. Uh, so resonance means that he, he is absorbing, he is absorbing something from the divine spirit rather than being, uh, just having it all in himself. And then there are his human followers, his, the skeptics, the opponents, we all know that. That's what we have always singled out. But we also have the towns and landscapes of Galilea Lilies, birds, foxes, trees, water. We have his extended body, his ecological habitats. And then, of course, we have also his long ethical and religious Jewish wisdom tradition of which he was part. His deep history, his actual age awareness about saying that God is more than we think God to be. So, how can we then define uh, deep incarnation? This is my own definition that I have reused several times uh, and also just, but this is the way I think about it. Divine logos wisdom. It's always logos and wisdom is the same. Logos is more masculine. My will clear wisdom is more, is a feminine Sophia was made flesh in Jesus Christ in such a comprehensive ma manner that by assuming the particular life story of Jesus, the Jew from Nazareth, God shares and ennobles the fate of all biological life forms from grass and lilies to humans and experience the joy and pains of sensitive creatures, sparrows, foxes, and the victims of evolution and history from the inside and out. And this from the inside and out is important. 
because this is the, the seminal new idea of incarnation that is rather rare in the history of the religions. He also conjoins the, the material conditions of creaturely existence, the all flesh that we saw above. And all this was done, was, is an example of a radical divine self-embodiment reaching into the root radix of physical, biological, and human existence, including processes of growth as well as decay, of love as well as traumas, and all that for the sake of the therapy and transformation of us and the cosmos. Then you might ask, what do you mean by the transformation of the cosmos? Well, I cannot have a theory of that because we are on a, on a way, I have to admit uh, in the same manner that I cannot have a theory of my own transformation because I'm not yet transformed. So there is here a sort of, of, of language that stops. We have a cataphatic language, a language alongside experience that then in the end must give, give way to an apophatic language where we actually say we cannot say more than we aim to say and then we will have to let God do the job that we cannot pre-conceptualize. There's also a Trinitarian framework for this, uh, for the concept of deep incarnation, that, they, that there's a divine stretch between the divine persons in God's internal life that facilitates a divine reach into our world. The Father is the, is the source of the divine reach. Um, but the self-materializing wisdom son of God reaches down in address and activation as well as co-suffering with the world, and the spirit is the divine love between father, of son, father and son who facilitates the movability and elevation of self-moving creatures in equal space. What, is, what I assume here is that we do not find, we do not find the spirit, we do not find Christ in every corner of the universe, even if Christ is ubiquitously present there. Uh, so also the spirit is, is, an, is seen as something that, that actually moves around and moves around also with us and elevates our, our created uh, potentialities. Now to biology finally. This was perhaps all too much about deep incarnation. The world of biology is a world of agency and suffering, not one thing without the other. I here take in a quotation from Carl Linnaeus, the, pre, the, the great pre-Darwinian uh, botanist of, uh, of Uppsala in a, a little writing called The Purpose of the Creator. And I just think it's beautiful because it speaks about agency, biological agencies, and says if animals did not exist, how tragic the world would be. Now oxen bellow, sheep bray, horses neigh, frogs uh, croak, birds sing in thousands of ways in the treetops, the cuckoo calls out his cuckoo, the trush babbles, the nightingale gale sings at night. And then comes the conclusion, without animals, the, the earth would be as if extinct. But now, dogs hunt hares, flies, oxen, falcon, pigeons, grapes, fish, storks, snakes, eagles, hens, and everything moves about. What I think is interesting here is that we have here a, a, also a, an aesthetic reading of predation, the, the kind of predation which actually in, in, in post-Darwinian uh, 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 thinking has been seen as a real nagging problem. How is it that we eat one another? And we must remember that we all eat other life. Even if you are vegetarian, you are eating the, the life of plants, and we are breathing the air that could be used for other purposes. So we can only uh, live uh, actually also by taking from others. This was not seen that way by Carl Linnaeus in the end of the 18th century. He still saw it in an aesthetic appreciation. The same actually did, did uh, also Charles Darwin. 
in many of his notebooks uh, from, the, from the rainforest. But for him, it was a nagging moral problem. How could a perfect God, a perfect moral God, allow uh, uh, a cat to, to, to play around with a mice? So we see here these two pictures of Linnaeus and, and Charles Darwin, both addressed both beauty and predation. But, uh, but uh, Linnaeus stayed in his aesthetic appreciation of the universe as it was. Some of my colleagues do that uh, uh, this day too. Whereas Darwin said, no, there is a problem here. So how can we actually build a bridge uh, between these two uh, figures? And I, I'm, I'm actually siding with Darwin, but I'm just saying that in Darwin's views, there's a lot to reap actually also from, uh, from a point of view like that of Irideus. So how can this difficult tree survive when it has roots on both sides and, and actually an, an abyss below? So we live in a world of agency and suffering, and I will go a little quick about this because it's more theoretical stuff. I will go to more, to more uh, um, contemporary stuff, uh, uh, also more stuff uh, in my lecture tomorrow. But it, I just mentioned Stuart Kaufman, who says that in order to be a biological being, then at least you need to do a thermodynamic work cycles. That is, you have to transform something. You have to go against the stream. You have to take in energy. You have to reap energy in order to do uh, one single thermodynamic work cycle so that you can actually uh, bend it into yourself and take in the energy. You, the cells in your body are busy doing work cycles all the time, very active. John Maynard Smith, he also speaks about biology as an information science. Uh, it's part of the, he, he is part of the book that, uh, that um, Paul Davis and I ad edited, um, and saying that genes are not only informational by storing information, it's not just about getting to know about the world, but also about providing instructions for subsequent adaptive purposes at developmental level. And I would say to this view that we actually do see a growth of informational structures during evolution. And uh, that the difference between physics and, and uh, biology is actually that there is a sort of retention in the biological realm. So I put it this way, whereas the language of information, this is a metaphor, in quantum mechanics speaks in terms of distinctive cuts, cuts. You have to go one way and not the other way. Decisions all the time. This and then not that. Then the world of the living is informational by creating new resonances. And the term resonance will be very important in the following days too. Build up, build up is the language of biological systems. But as soon as they build up, they are going to decay too. We are all going to, to, to decay. So what we can learn from biology is that beauty and hardship go together. We also in the classic tradition find the distinction between two sorts of, of cosmos, meaning one, the God's good, good creation, and so God loved the world that he sends his son to the world, but also the evil world of sin. You should not be children of this world, for example. But the point is, and what we can learn from biology, is that in between the classic concept of the goodness of creation and the likewise classic concept of human, of the human world of sin, we have biological facts of disintegration, illness, pain, and death, alongside biological expressions of beauty and creativity. Because, as I will argue, you cannot have the one without the other, and that aches but we don't live in a perfect world. And the things that aches in our life is not derived from human sin. We are getting illnesses without having done something, and innocent people are getting cancer and everything else. So there's no moral explanation of the world. So we can discuss interpretations, but we must bend to facts. And this fact is that the evil of this world 
does not derive from human evil. We were simply too late in evolution for doing that. And the evils of the natural evils of which I speak here are everywhere in the in the world. In lions, in in ants and whatever you, you want to think of dolphins, whatever we want to think of. As soon as we have something built up, there's also a downfall because we are undergirded by the law of entropy that, that things cannot go on unless we, 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 we reap new material. It's a hard lesson, but I think it's something new that is not written in the textbooks of theology but that we really have to learn and take in from biology. So what are the cause of evolution? Very many. Disintegration. As soon as you have a complex structure, then you actually can disintegrate. Death as a cause of, as a cause of sexual re reproduction, yes. You could also say, if, you, if we had the choice, you, you actually you don't need to die. Imagine that you are uni, uh, 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 a unicellular organism who could just, I mean, reproduce by dividing yourself. Then you didn't know to, to then you didn't need to die. But I don't think it would be a very interesting life. So I think you have to to accept and be happy and grateful for your complexity. But that is a conflict, conflict, a complexity that comes with a cost. The same with pain. If we did not have a neural system that worked, we could not feel pain. It's a hard thing, we know that. Uh, but there are people who have, who have the problem that they cannot feel pain, and they don't live very long. There have been a very few of them. Um, uh, they died. She one died when she was in the, her 30s, because she couldn't react appropriately to the world, because she didn't feel the, the, the world. And as the same thing about suffering as a cause of complex cognitive ev emotional capacities. Think about anxiety that we have in forms that, the, that animals do not have. So maybe we have more suffering in the human world than even in the wild wo uh, world where there are predators because it's fast. But we live with it. We have anxiety as, and as my country, fellow countryman, uh, Søren Kierkegaard, uh, writes about in the concept of anxiety. We have personal tragedy, but we would have no tragedies if we didn't have love, if we didn't have somebody to lose. Then it, it would just be, oh, then that happened. But we are tied in, we are connected. We are socially connected with one, one another. Therefore, we have, we have tragedies. We have social fi uh, fiascos as a result of bringing unwelcome new good news, as Jesus, for example. But it's, it's a widespread phenomenon that people sometimes are right, but they don't get it. They are not, ex they are not seen as those who saw, who saw the right thing. It's a general thing. So we have the three classic Christian troubles with Darwin, the common descent, the so-called ape theory, are we nothing but uh, ants and, or, and apes? I think it's not a real problem. I think everyone, I'm just happy that I'm not the only creature. <laughs> I, 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 I like I, uh, the idea that, we, that there are uh, creatures that are cleverer than, than I in many respects, like a dog can smell more and, and, and uh, birds can fly, which I cannot. Um, and I like that we have some commonality with our fellow creatures. So I'm not a speciesist in that way. I think we can learn that from Darwin too. Then we have the mutation theory, which was not part of, of, um, of um, uh, Darwin's theory in that form, but the, the principle of chance was there. You could say, if there is chance, then is there no providence? Well, I will come back to this issue on, in my third lecture uh, uh, again. And then we have what I think is the real stuff. The, the real potential conflict stuff is selection theory. Is nature a ruthless me mechanical affair? And if that is so, 
how can this be compatible with a loving uh, God? So now I'll go through some theoretical discussion. So it will be a little theoretical today, and then I'll go on with other stuff uh, tomorrow. Natural selection can take place at different levels. At the gene level that we have in the strict neo-Darwinian uh, theories back to Weissman, 1892, to, to uh, Richard Dawkins, they say the only thing that matters is genes. The selection uh, um, it takes place in, de in, in, in genes, but the, our, the organisms are, the, are those who either, either go on or do not go on, are the units of selection, but they are not those who really can, can go on. But then, what I've learned uh, also by working in a group of, uh, with, uh, of, um, of uh, theoretical biologists and historical um, biologists uh, in the context of ISSR, uh, Interna International Society of, for the Study of Science and Religion, we have actually very different uh, understandings of Darwinism in Britain, we've had this very individualistic thinking that we see in, in, in Dawkins, whereas in, um, in American developmental biology, we have a much more organism-oriented thinking. And then we have, also, of course, the discussions about group-level theory with Eliot Soper and David Sloan Wilson. We have niche construction theory. I will come back to these examples later. Because what does natural selection mean? Well. We can have the fight club metaphor, as I now call it. All individuals are fighting against all other individuals apart from kin. So I take care of my own children, but the rest of the world are my foes. In reality, this is the story that is told in the public uh, dissemination of the, uh, of the gene-centered, individualism-centered uh, uh, biology or some groups fighting against other groups, Russians against Ukraine, and so on. Then we have, and all this is, says, said Michael Roos, I, uh, the, all this is fopped upon us by evolution, as he said in his early days. I think that Michael Roos, who is part of this book too, is, has changed his mind. Then we have what I would call the gentleman's sports uh, model. And, uh, my, I apologize for making a gendered uh, uh, model here, but um, this is a, an old n uh, notion. So here we have individuals cooperating within the group and some groups uh, also uh, uh, between them, like we have in science, we are cooperating with one another. At some point we are also actually competing with, with one another when we're going to have a new position uh, or something like that. Uh, um, and, um, and the, 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 the problem is that if we say that we do not only have selection at gene level, also at, at organismic level, in, uh, uh, and um, because organisms also strive for something, and, and we also have groups, then this does not easily translate into a more p uh, um, picture. So mm -hmm. as... Um, uh, Eliot Soper and David Sloan Wilson say in Unto Others, the evolution of psychology and psychology of unselfish behavior, group selection favors within group niceness and between group nastiness. We have to think about that also when we are cultivating an us, because it's good to cultivate an us, but we often cultivate an us against all the others. Uh, so it is this. So there's not so much left of the gentleman after some time in this model either. Then we have the artistic model, which I think is we can find in different versions. We have the old notion of genetic drift in civil right, uh, and uh, this notion, very interesting notion of a multi-adaptive exploration of eco space. So you're just if you are at a peak, then you are going to to explore new stuff, and then you will also go down uh, the slope, uh, but then you will eventually find something new, a sort of positivism that is actually part of civil rights model. Here I follow Michael Ruse's interpretation of him. Uh, we, can, we can also have examples that individuals and groups live and develop in tandem with one another. I cannot get any 
better example than the domestication of dogs and horses, where you could say, well, don't we take away the wilderness of the, uh, the, of, of, of the horse and the dog when we domesticate them? I will come back to this question in, in, uh, also in uh, tomorrow evening, uh, uh, because what are the values of wilderness what are the values of stewardship and gardening, and, and what are actually the, val the, the values of accepting that we are ourselves part of a natural nexus. These are the three uh, models for an eco-theology that I will develop tomorrow. We also find a very, uh, a theory, in this construction theory, which emphasizes the cultural, biocultural adaptation, <coughs> which is very much, um, about also um, environment, and I think it's interesting for these reasons that we have evolutionary relationships not just about genes or my own or my own little organism or my kin, but between uh, biota and abiota. So we actually creating landscapes like an earthworm described by, by, by Darwin in his own work already without giving it that name, but the beaver creating a dam we, is, is something that is transmitted to the next generation. So it does overcome standard dichotomies between organisms and their environments and focuses on the creative aspect, aspects of evolution rather than only responsive or defensive aspects of evolution. So it seems to give a broader network view of evolutionarily relevant causes rather than postulating one single universal explanation behind all processes. So, if we take Theodore Dobzhansky's well-known quote, a nudget, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of, of evolution, then I think it should be, or could be amended in a friendly sense, saying nothing makes sense in evolution except in light of ecology. That would not be, uh, I think it's a friendly amendment, but of course Theodore even if he was an, a, a developmentalist and, 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 and thinking in terms of organisms rather than, than only genes, he was still uh, he was he was he was still committed to the to what could be focused upon rather than the broader network analysis. So um, this was just one example. Now it comes. And then the question is: What do we mean by selection? Whether you take one sense or another, and these are not alternatives. I mean, there can, there, there can be selection at gene levels, at, at organismic level, uh, uh, or group level, or, or uh, group culture, uh, group uh, APOTA level. Uh, so it's really not about either or, but what do we mean by selection? And then many have this ring in the ear that selection is a ruthless mechanism going on which is fopped upon us by our genes, by evolution. So you cannot but, so Putin cannot but invade Ukraine and so on. And this doesn't work and also the, the classic sociobiologists also knew that it is not that simple and many of them really put culture as a constraint on evolution. So we should imagine that, that, that uh, uh, a, a, a popular biologist like Richard Dawkins, that he is really uh, has high regards for culture because he sees culture as the restraint of, of this egotistic biological drives. But Eliot Soper has a very sober view, I think, on evolutionary biology. He says, well, Natural selection shows why the actual cause of an event is, in a sense, explanatorily irrelevant. That's a very radical statement. It shows that the identity of the actual cause doesn't matter as long as it is one of the set of possibilities of a certain kind. That means <clears throat> you, can, you can be a survivor through extreme friendship, through generosity or by being a fighter. But for the, the very term of selection has a specific meaning, so we should not neither moralize uh, selection nor 
immoralize selection because it's like a, the, the net result of the processes taking place, which simply says something survives, other things does not survive. So I think we need to accept the package deal of creation. Um, it was first with multicellularity that death come into being, first with the nervous system that pain come in, came into being, came into the world, and first with consciousness that anxiety came into the world. And I think that science can offer an explanation in broad and general terms about that, saying you cannot have the one without the other. You cannot have one you love without risking to lose her or him. But then the question is, would we prefer to live without death, pain, and anxiety? Science cannot respond to that issue as science. Then we are in a, in a common realm. Then we are, in a sense, on the common marketplace of ideas. Uh, uh, but so, we, uh, so where are we then? Well, we are very many places. And I will just try now to wrap up what I've said and also say a little more with a scheme, don't look too much on the screen because it's too small. The pre-moral aspects of evolution, what I have called the package deal of joys and woes, leads, I think, to a, a necessary distinction in our theologizing about the world between moral evil and evolutionary hardship. So, it is, so I know that people say it's unfair that I get cancer. I, I know that people say it because that's from an anthrop anthropocentric perspective. It is. And why, why he and not me getting ill? I know that. But I'm not sure that this is the way to deal with it because we have to do with an evolutionary hardship. And you, one should not seek an easy why question of, of, uh, of that. But we should cry. And, and overcome this situation until we no longer can overcome it. I think we have to be honest to ourselves. Also, if we are going to be honest uh, 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 about God, as one of your students said this day in the, uh, uh, at the surface, service. So I think that natural evil is an infelicious term. We should talk about hardship. It's hard. It's really hard. We can also say, well, there might be a free process defense. You can say, as my older colleague and, and friend Holmes Rolston uh, 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 wrote, the pain of the prey is redeemed by the pleasure of the predator. It's a very hard question. I'm taking this question up here because in a sense it is a way back. We are in a sense back to the position of Carlineus. It's an aesthetic position. But he also argues that we are that the that the predator is actually capturing value by by uh, by uh, uh, from the from the prey. But there is another position which is the one that I uh, am for which is to say that there will be a, we cannot stay with this, uh, with the aesthetic view, we cannot stay with the moral view. There, there are questions that we, where we have to say there is a deep co-suffering and also a deep resurrection part in the world in which we are living. And we have to, we have in a sense not to, not to aestheticize it or to moralize it uh, uh, prematurely. In a sense, this is also an apophatic uh, position. It's both something saying, I think the, the God is part of this, but God is not the explanation of why, why it is so and not otherwise. I would also argue that a marketplace argument for this view would be that if we think that God actually for, forgives me, or forgives other sinners, or whatever, without doing anything more, wouldn't that be unethical? Can you forgive the commandant 
of, the, uh, of, of Auschwitz on behalf of, of 50,000 uh, innocent Jews. No, you can only, f the, so one could argue, and my, my uh, Danish compatriot, uh, K.E. Lökstrup argues that you can only, Jesus wa was only allowed to forgive people indiscriminately on the basis of his belief that God would take care. But this is a sort of a reference to God that could not be guaranteed or, or anything like that. So I am thinking that we need to think along these lines. I just sketch out very briefly a Trinitarian theodicy. It is, uh, that in a sense we have to accept that there is also a, a sort of, of breath of being, of scope of being. There is a letting be which is part of, of God uh, creating a world with integrity and dignity. Uh, it's also a question about exploring possibilities, but not all possibilities turn out to be very nice for us, even if we, if we are the ones who are trying them out. So in the beginning, God said, let it be. Let the world come into being and also let it be. This is not a stay back attitude in my view, but it is also a promise of a self in, uh, involvement so that God in the midst of time, that is the addition of Christology, uh, argues or, or promises or, or opens the, the view that God is enduring the cost of cre uh, uh, creation and at the end of time or wherever God will recreate what is lost. So that this is where my, uh, my colleague in, at Fordham University, Elizabeth jo Johnson, has spoken about deep resurrection. You cannot sensibly speak about deep incarnation without also talking about a deep resurrection. And I must say that I have learned that from, from her. And uh, by this last uh, reference away from my own work, I would like to thank you for your attention so far. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Gregerson, for a rich and stimulating uh, lecture tonight. We really appreciate it. We'll transition now to a time of question and discussion. So I'd invite you to start thinking uh, along what you'd like to ask, Professor Gregerson. And while you do that, why don't we, uh, with deference to uh, Sark's meaning three, Let's all stand for a moment and give our bodies a break while I describe how the Q&A period will run. So what we're going to do is, if you'd like to ask Dr. Gregerson a question, I'd invite you in the room here to please go to one of the two microphone stands on either side of the seats here. And please come up close to the microphone. And if you could keep it relatively concise and be sure that it's a question, that would be much appreciated. If you are joining us online through the live stream and would like to ask a question, uh, you can email us at questions at regent-college.edu. That's questions at regent-college.edu. Feel free to submit those and we can ask those on your behalf. You can be seated now. And I'll just start it off with one question to position your Christological proposal uh, with respect to other Christological proposals we've heard with respect to the sciences here at Regent. So John Polkinghorne has lectured here. Uh, Professor Emeritus Lauren Wilkinson has worked with his concept of creation as kenosis. Mm. So another Christological proposal mm. here saying, as you well know, that um, just as Jesus self-empties, as it were, in Philippians 2, so God, in some sense, our term, uh, self-limits to bestow biological agency. How do you position deep incarnation vis-a-vis -vis this self-limitation picture of creation as kenosis? It is uh, a question that I'm relatively often asked, and uh, so it's a very good question. Uh, and um, because 
Some would argue that the concept of divine infinity with which I began is really not uh, compatible with a knotic view of God. Uh, but I think it is. So, the, so what the, the concept of divine infinity of God embracing all of us is inconsistent with a view that uh, God, in a sense, stops, puts a full stop, and cannot but have a full stop in order to safeguard my autonomy. But then we have the competition model. And uh, in more uh, theological and also philosophical terms, I'm actually in for a, a, a compatibilism. That means that, that God is fully active even as God is giving space and room. And this can only be, this point can only be made if it is, as you said, it's, it's a self-limitation. So it's a built uh, limitation. So God, can, who is bigger than the biggest, can actually be smallest, smaller than the smallest, as we saw. So, I, so there are some going, arguing that kenosis uh, is not compatible with, with divine infinity or with panentheism uh, or something like that, but I don't see it that way. But thank you very much for, for because it's a very central question that in a sense recapitulates the, uh, all that I have tried to say. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Very clear. Let's go to this microphone here. Yeah, hi there. Uh, my name's Jason. I'm very interested in the conversation about theodicy. But I'm wondering if I missed the piece on uh, divine telos or purpose. I, I hear you kind of naturalizing suffering into the, the created order, but does deep incarnation have any sense of a direction for creation, a telos for creation? <clears throat> and does suffering, do we endure suffering in, at, until that telos, or is it, is it in the fabric of becoming or being or however you want to talk about it? Thank you for this question. Uh, um, it is, um, we, you are actually addressing so, one of the arch old questions between Christian creation theology and Darwinism, which was the argument from design. Uh, and so would, would not Darwinian thinking mean be a naturalized thinking, as you said, that actually would be would, uh, would uh, not allow any talk about divine design, and hence not a concept of divine providence, of, of a concrete divine care, and not just as a divine emotion, but also a, ca a caring for, a moving on. S and I think that it all depends, up, I would say, first of all, you cannot, I think you cannot take away purpose from our understanding of mental life and then still have mind. And this applies to God as well. But if we by purpose mean that the only way of thinking of a divine purpose or any real purpose would be that someone from the outset has a plan and it has to be enacted in in this way, on this way, and if one goes, uh, uh, if uh, um, an agent chooses B, then God will know what God will do then. This would be like God, like a, a, a chess player. We have that, we have this argument in Peter Geech's book. It's a very well, well done argument, but I, I think that it, in a sense, presupposes a plan that where we, where not only are we going in in a in a in a certain direction, and we are going to an to a to an end, to the reign of God or eternal life or whatever you would say, but you need to have a specific plan, a perfect plan for this for this world, and in that sense. <laughs> I, I think that I, it's, this is not what I think is a very good way of thinking theologically. And I do think 
that we have, that we could say something like the following. First of all, we could have, God is in a sense, and now I use a little technical term, but God is a second order planner. Not planning this, that, this, that, this, that. But a, a general direction, as you said, you use the, the term, going for a specific direction. And I think that's very compatible with, with, uh, uh, with a, a concept of, of, of God as a caring father or, or mother or whatever. So I think that is. But would it be if I now had a child, uh, I do have a child, but now it, I, I take a, an imaginative fifth child, and then I said none of my children actually have chosen theology. So I think, because I know best and I'm the father, I think that this poor little boy, he should definitely be a theologian. Then I would be, I think, a bad parent. So I understand the, the parent, the divine parenthood, if we use that metaphor, and all the associated ideas of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of planning as something which is very verbal, which is very ongoing, and not in, in a prefixed plan. But I know that here I am actually not taking side with very uh, great theologians of the past, including both Thomas Aquinas and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Martin Luther, whom I have coded before. Because, because uh, Thomas Aquinas, he would say, I think it's paragraph 46 in his Summa Theologiae, that, uh, that, uh, that the uh, that uh, providence is the, is the execution of the plan that God had in the beginning. Executio is a, at least the, the term used. And Luther would argue that God is, in a sense, deciding at each moment, but really deciding. So, so I think that this freedom view uh, 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 is uh, always a limited freedom. It's a, it's a freedom in a divine, uh, uh, in a, in a divine uh, uh, environment. Uh, but it is, it is very, it's, it's piecemeal. And I think that you and I cannot detect the overall uh, 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 divine uh, design. Let's go to this side and Eric. I think I have a comment and a question, but I might have two questions. Um, first of all, I really appreciated your uncoupling of death, pain, and anxiety. Um, well, you're putting that under the category of evolutionary hardship, um, and it felt to me like you were fully and finally uncoupling it from original sin, uh, which felt really helpful. <laughs> uh, but I'm, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong about that, but thank you for that. Mm. Uh, my question, um, I don't think my thinking around incarnation has gotten any more sophisticated than uh, what happened at the Council of Chalcedon uh, back in 451. And the formula of Chalcedon, of course, is that uh, when they're, as they're, th it, they're thinking about incarnation, uh, it's that Jesus was fully human, fully divine. Those two aren't confused with each other, but you can't tease those two out from each other. Um, and I was thinking, I was wondering about your use of sarks. Um, if Jesus, instead of, I mean, if you, by extension, Jesus was fully sarks uh, and fully divine. Um, I'm just curious, uh, do you see deep incarnation in your articulation of deep incarnation as an extension of and deepening of the Chalcedonian way of thinking about incarnation? Um, and if you don't, how would you differentiate uh, deep incarnation from the Chalcedonian formula? Thank you. Again, a very precise question. Uh, and um, this time I can even, ideally speaking, give you a very uh, precise answer, at least as to my own views, uh, because I've written a long, longer article about um, deep incarnation and Chalcedon, uh, and trying to remind of the Chalcedonian concept of mixes. Um, the, the Chalcedonians were uh, Gregor of Nyssa, Gregor of Nassians, and, and uh, Basil the Great, and both the two Gregories have a very strong notion of a mixis. These, are, these, these uh, thinkers were pre-Chalcedonian. So you could say that you, you are not allowed to, 
to mix up the natures. I agree with that. Because you cannot say that now God became human and was no longer God. And now uh, I actually uh, become united with God and therefore I'm identical with God. So there is really a distinction to be maintained. But, the, but uh, I think that, uh, that Chalcedon is not the end point. I think that all historians of theology would say that because formally speaking, the Chalcedon from 451 actually was not, was not thought through in a purely doc doctrinal tradition until the second, uh, uh, un until the, the uh, in, in Constantinople, uh, uh, 680 to 81, where it was, where we, it was emphasized that by being fully human, uh, 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 the, the person of Christ, of Jesus Christ, also have, had to have a human will. So this was Maximus, the confessor, going down that is providing the groundwork for what is called the Neo-Chalcedonian Christology, which I think was an extreme advance. And in the case of Maximus of Confessor, you actually have very many of the ideas of deep incarnation. So, I'm, so I, 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 I see uh, um, uh, Chalcedon not as an end, uh, as an end point, but as a starting point, and I'm here actually, I think I have uh, most of the historians with me, both on the Catholic side and on the Protestant side. Um, so I think that, you know, also to put it otherwise, it is said that it is a definition, but the, but the Greek term is horismos. That is, it's a horizon for interpreting Christology. It is not the end solution. This is a point that, um, that Sarah Coakley has made very convincingly in, in, an, uh, in an article some 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, so it has to be move on. But what is problematic about deep incarnation is that it, is, that it so much focuses on the divine and, and the human, that it must not be mixed up, that it must not be divided, that in a sense it leads to a a self-forgetfulness in the Christian tradition about the world of which we as human beings are part. So there is a, a it's a too focused human, human divine thinking that I think we need to overcome. Uh, no, in, in, in Chalcedon, the, the term is phusis, uh, 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 phusis or nature, uh, or which also can be that which grows naturally, and it is said that, that, uh, the human, that the human nature of the one person of Jesus Christ, the hypostatic person, uh, um, has to have a human soul or mind but does not speak about the, uh, the, 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 the will. Um, I, it, it, it can be argued that in the concept of the physis, which of course is not our, it is not our language today, but this is what they used. Divine physis and then, uh, or, or phys a divine physics and a, and a human physics. This is not our uh, way of talking today or nature, or divine nature, human nature. Uh, but it can be argued that this, that, that phusis also means, it relates to usia, which is a more, a broader term, meaning simply a, a, a being. So he was like us in all things, apart from sin, like in the letter to the Hebrews. So, so I think that if, if, if I were to work more with, with Chalcedon, then I would think that, that all this must, uh, has to be uh, uh, supposed, and there is a new book com came coming out. Uh, I, was, I was peer reviewing it, and I, now I can't. Rebecca was her first name, uh, who actually made the argument that I just made. Let's go to this microphone here, Noah, and then we'll take an online question from Mary Beth. 
thanks. Um, I, like I believe you said in your lecture, um, would consider myself a, a Christian Darwinist as well. Um, one of the questions that I've struggled with recently that I'm wondering if deep incarnation might have an answer for um, is how we understand the, um, the specificity of, of our being made in God's image and, and what that means in terms of our humanity as um, something um, distinct from, from other life. And I, I didn't know if uh, your thoughts on deep incarnation might address that or maybe, maybe I missed it in the lecture, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Mm. Well, you are posing very good questions, all of you. Um, <clears throat> I think there's no, so this is, I, I think that it is quite clear that we humans can do something that other, our other co-creatures cannot. So, so we have an awareness, also a religious awareness, which means that in a sense we are, we are, we are mirroring ourselves vis-a-vis -vis God, a sort of ideal. So even, and I'm trying to give a very low uh, 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 redescription of, of, uh, of, of uh, Imago Dei. So for me, Imago Dei means that we have a, a, that we have a special role. But I'm, I'm not thereby saying that we are therefore better than all others, but we have a very special role because we have awareness. Therefore, we, can, we, have a, we, we are about to destroy uh, our planet. But we may also have an impetus to do something about it. And we would not be that if we, we were lions or whales or, or even dogs. But we should know that there are other, I think it's a fantastic idea that there are some of other, our other co-creatures who are better than us in other respects in terms of, 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 of uh, eyesight and hearing and sounding and echolocation in, 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, dolphins and uh, this sense of symmetry and, and things like that. So I think it's very important. Another thing it is important is that, that Imago Dei or the image of God also means that it's something that all of us have. So also those that we do not like. You are also created, so you should always treat your enemy as one who is created in the Im image and likeness of God. So that's why the, this, um, this notion of imago comes up first in, in, uh, uh, in Genesis 1, uh, 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 27 and 8. Uh, he, God created them as man and women, uh, and, and woman, he created them in his image and, and, and likeness. That is, it's about relationality there. And then it is, uh, there is a sign, then it's set in, in, um, in Genesis chapter five, that, uh, and, and Adam and Eva, and, and, and they, they uh, actually made love and, and uh, procreated because they were in the created in the likeness of God, which is after the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the curse or the fall, as we say, which is in, in, in chapter three. And then in the end, it is simply, it is set upon a person that you are not allowed to kill. So, it, one, we are, mirror, we are mirroring us with God, we, have a, we are something special. Two, we have an ethical obligation to all, to all human beings. Uh, and then you could say, don't we have it to others? And, and that's another question that you can ask. And third, I think that the imago di simply is a theological statement means that God wants something specific from you and me and us. So I, I'm not, I'm, I'm starting out in a general marketplace description of, of the Imago D, but I do not want to, re to take away the, the specific theological uh, background of that concept or impetus to that concept. Okay. Mary Beth. Uh, this question was submitted online. 
um, by Greg. He says, uh, in Regent's theology and science class last year, we read that the progress of science was enabled by Christian theology's recognition and emphasis of the creator-creation distinction. The question is, um, does not the early part of the lecture, including the Aquinas and Luther quotes, serve to blur the creator-creation distinction, and if so, at what cost to our conception of God? Thank you very much uh, to Greg for this uh, question too. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a distinction is not a separation. That must be the, 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 the baseline. A distinction means that God remains God and I remain human. And even if I'm created in the image of God, I'm not becoming God. And even in the incarnation, Christ was not uh, stopped being coming from God, in a sense. Um, what, I, what I really want to, to overcome, but, and, I, and I'm glad to know that I'm not alone in this regard, mm -hmm. is the understanding that God is, in a sense, living alongside the world. We have the world here, and then we have God alongside the world. And then we maybe have God as a specific agent. That's where I started out with, the, with Rowan Williams, because he is actually uh, uh, he's a good thinker. Well, he's also archbishop, and the two things go well together, of course. So, I'm, so I am... Um, in, in Luther, it is, uh, Luther is more radical than Thomas Aquinas in this regard because his argument was that with the resurrection of Christ, you cannot take away his humanity from the way God is God. So in a sense, it was a very Lutheran argument that I made, uh, but of course I make it not only with respect to humanity and divinity, but also with respect to, to, our, uh, to the material configurations of which we are part. If I were to give an, an, a possibility for reading, if, it, if you have it, if you ask this from a philosophical uh, uh, side, and I don't know about that because I cannot see you here. May, I could not have seen it uh, anyway. But um, then I would say uh, that I would like to refer to M Michel Henry, because many of you here in, in, in Canada, you probably, you all uh, uh, fluid in French, I'm not. His book on incarnation, uh, which makes the point that that the incarnation means a pervasive touching and being touched all over. And this, he, I know that I'm going a little uh, on another uh, drive now, but, but he contrasts this to the otherwise very fine view of, uh, of Merleau-Ponty, who argues that our flesh character is, is uh, actually related to our skin. So if you take two hands, you can do it here in the audience hall, try to do this, and then follow down. Then you will, then you will, you will discover that you, can, that you can only, it's only one of the hands that is touching, and the other is touched. Try to do it here. So, you, so they, there's a touching, touching, touched relationship. And Michel Henri, as a, as a philosopher, phenomenologist, and a Christian, he says incarnation means that there's touching and touched all over. So, and I think that this touching and touched does not take away from God's divinity, but this expresses the way in which God is God, as meaning that, that there is an that there is an emotional and also, of course, a cognitive as aspect and a personal aspect in, in all that happens. So I don't think that, it, that there is a conflict. Long, long answer. 
Okay, we're going to go with one last question. My apologies to those who are still waiting at the microphone. Uh, for the sake of time, we need to wrap up. Um, but we will have time afterwards to speak with Dr. Gregerson at the book table. Uh, but let's go with this last question here from John. Thank you, Dr. Gregerson. Um, I think, I, I wonder if there's a, a fourth sense of Sark's okay. um, that uh, I'm pulling from John 6, where Jesus talks about uh, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. I wonder if you could talk about the implications of that use of Sark's for the model that you've presented. Because uh, it seems to me that Christ is there setting apart a piece of creation to identify with. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Hmm. I think it's something that I should not... Um, I have thought about it before, but I've not come to any... I've not worked it through. And I think you are pointing to, um, to the question about where do we have the low chai? The, where do we have... Uh, where that which is already there appears to us. So it's like a... It's a where do we have the revelatory aspects of, of, of the depth of incarnation shining forth. And I think that must be part of it. So I'm always say, so my, my argument is always that in order to have a, a theological concept of incarnation, apart from saying that God is there, which is important prior to me, independently of my faith, so it's not my faith that makes God present. God is there, and faith is actually always secondary, uh, uh, attaching to Christ or, or, or grabbing what is there. Um, but then also it has to be to become real for us. And uh, you can, you, one could say that this for us character is a special thing, is a fourth mode, but I rather would like to think the, the first sense of sex as a human body as already in itself communicative. And I like to think of the sex three as itself communicative, but in ways that we cannot capture. So there may, might be designated places where we can say, there you can find me in the, you can find me at the table. And and and, uh, uh, and 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 at baptism, these are unambiguous words. The words of creation are many and ambiguous. They are said to you. Christ wants to be found there. So I see the 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 burden of what you're saying, or the or the the, the intensity that you are asking for. That's a wonderful point to end on. Let's once again thank our lecturer tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you again for your time and attention tonight. Let me uh, wrap up with three quick announcements. Um, first, if you'd like more of this high quality discussion about God and profound realities like creativity and suffering, uh, consider enrolling in one of our summer courses coming up at Regent College or perhaps one of our graduate programs. Uh, so you can visit rgnt.net for more information about those, rgnt.net. Uh, second, I'd like to mention that we have a booth outside from the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation, so we're very glad to have Mark here from that uh, association. So if you'd like more uh, uh, information about the work that they're doing with scientists and Christians across the country, uh, they have some great events and literature there for you as well. You can meet with Mark. Uh, Finally, as I've mentioned before, Professor Gregerson has kindly agreed, because it is the middle of the night in, in Copenhagen, uh, to, to visit at the book table for a few moments here afterwards. So those of you that didn't get to ask your question, um, I'll direct you there. And you can also browse his books, as well as our other selection at the Regent College Bookstore. Otherwise, I hope to see you tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, here in the chapel for the lecture, Wondering, Intervening, and Enmeshment, Deep Incarnation, and the Three Ecologies. Thank you and have a good night. <laughs>